Hello all and welcome to Tomorrow News. Now in this week's episode, Ryan's going to be lighting up his Raptor. I'm going to not tell you about things you're not supposed to know about. Dr. Tamitha Scove is back with space weather and then I'll cruise on out to the end of our episode. Now before we get started, just want to let you know, of course, that if you like us here at Tomorrow, don't forget to subscribe to us, like our videos, share our videos, hit the little notification bell. Where I think it's over there. You can set it up for all of our videos or just a few videos depending upon what you would like. So let's go ahead and get started with tomorrow news for May 11th, 2020. And we're going to go ahead and head on over to Ryan to start with our SpaceX update. Starship has been burning, although it hasn't yet left the launch stand. On May the 7th, SpaceX lit up the Raptor engine on the SN4 vehicle in preparation for a short 150 meter hop coming very soon. This video here really shows the power of the Raptor engine, as just one will be able to lift this entire vehicle into the sky. But it isn't just SN4 that is being worked on, as SN6 has made an appearance. Although it is in individual sections at the moment, I have no doubt that the team down in Boca Chica will get that vehicle under construction in no time at all. It's not only the Starship development that is getting me very excited about the future of this company, but it is also the special launch coming up in only 17 days. Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley, the two astronauts who will be travelling on Demo Mission 2, have completed their final training in Houston. They ran through a full launch simulation in the SpaceX Dragon simulator, making sure that they are prepped for everything if anything goes wrong. The Dragon capsule that will be used for DM2 is also going through its own final preparation in Cape Canaveral, awaiting the launch of what I believe will be a very historic mission for the new era of spaceflight. The Dragon capsule and its crew should be on orbit from anywhere between two to three months, as NASA are going to have to play a balancing act to serve all of their needs, being the need to keep the ISS with enough astronauts for a significant period of time, but they also need to certify the Dragon for future human flight, and until it is back on Earth, they can't say that. Just before the next episode is released, on May 17th at 0800 UTC, SpaceX will be launching Starlink 7, which will include sunshades on the satellites. More of that will be explained next week, but for the time being, I believe Jared has some more launches for you. We'll be heading to China this week for a double feature launch and arrival, and it's a doozy on May 5th at 10100 Universal Time. China's largest rocket, the Long March 5, lifted off from the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center. This was a big one for China. This is a special version of the Long March 5 rocket known as the 5B, specifically designed for lofting modules for an upcoming space station and their new crewed spacecraft, which a prototype was the payload for this flight, roughly 21 and a half metric tons on the uphill. The Long March 5B uses a stage and a half method, meaning the outside boosters drop off while the center core continues to take its payload to orbit. And that worked, successfully deploying the prototype spacecraft into low Earth orbit. Now one experiment, the flexible inflatable cargo re-entry vehicle, which tested an inflatable heat shield as a means of returning cargo from that upcoming space station, was reported to have failed. But the prototype crewed space spacecraft passed with flying colors, raising its orbit to nearly 8,000 kilometers in altitude and re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at 9 kilometers per second. Now, it came down under three parachutes and unlike China's current Shenzhou spacecraft, it deployed six airbags to soften its landing instead of the usual landing rockets. That touchdown occurred at 0549 Universal Time on May 8th in China's Inner Mongolia region. So far, all reports have been calling the flight a total Total success. Of note, because of that stage and a half design, the core stage of the Long March 5 rocket does actually make it all the way to orbit, and it is not controlled at any point after that. That means that when it performs its re-entry, it will be uncontrolled. And it's pretty big, actually. It's 30 meters long, 5 meters in diameter, and weighs about 20 metric tons. So the last time we had something that big performing an uncontrolled re-entry was Space Station Mir. And luckily, we can report that earlier today, that core stage did re-enter into the Atlantic Ocean just off of the west coast of Africa. And here are this week's upcoming launches.
What I'm about to tell you is top secret. So top secret, I can't even talk about showing you me telling you that what I'm about to tell you is top secret because even it being top secret is a top secret. So don't tell anyone I told you. Got it? Okay, no worries. I'm confused too. But you know what isn't top secret? The United States Air Force has their own little mini shuttle called the X-37B. Now, most of the time on those flights, we don't really get a lot of details. The payloads on them are classified. Even which of the X-37Bs that the United States Air Force has two of, that's also classified as to which one is flying which mission. So you would imagine for the upcoming sixth flight, OTV-6, we're not gonna know about any of the payloads on board. They're all gonna be classified, right? Well, nope, we actually know about a few of them. Now, two NASA experiments are going to be on board with this flight. One of those will expose materials to the conditions of space. Another will expose seeds to radiation. The Naval Research Laboratory is flying a prototype for a system that would turn solar power into radio microwave energy for transmitting to Earth. A little mini test of space-based solar power, which, if you know someone who lived through the 70s or is a big fan of Gerard K. O'Neill, ask them about space-based solar power. And the U.S. Air Force, they're also going to have a small satellite on board, Falcon Sat 8, which will be deployed. The rest of the experiments, you guessed it, classified. So uh, yeah, we don't know. But one cool thing that we do know about this mission that has not been done before is that this specific X-37B is going to be flying with a service module where a lot of these experiments are going to be hanging out at. Did you see it in all of the photos? See? There it isn't. Yep. You guessed right. We know that there's a service module there because the United States Air Force has said, yes, we're flying it on this X-37B, but what does it look like? Well, that's classified. It's literally right below the bottom of all of these pictures. And no pictures, please. And I thought visiting SpaceX and Hawthorne was stringent. The X-37B is one of the United States Air Force's crown jewels in terms of being able to do research and development and experimentation. And I'm really looking forward to those materials experiments that NASA is going to be performing on board. And you know what affects materials out in space is space weather. So let's go ahead and go to Dr. Tamitha Sko for this week's space weather update. After a little bit of a reprieve, space weather this week is definitely beginning to pick up. As we switch to our front side sun, you can see a finger-like coronal hole in the south. That is now rotating into the Earth's strike zone, and it's been sending us some fast solar wind uh, just over the past day or so. And that fast solar wind is definitely kicking aurora up, especially at high latitudes. It's also uh, affecting the near-Earth space environment. And along with a remnant coronal hole that's continuing to rotate in through the Earth strike zone, over the next couple days, expect for these kind of disturbed conditions to continue. Now, as we switch to our far-sighted sun, now this is Stereo A and it's looking at the sun from the side. You can see yet another finger-like coronal hole from the south. That is beginning to rotate into Earth view and it should give us some more disturbances here probably in about a week or so. But pretty much other than that, the sun has been pretty spotless, except for the last couple days. You can see some stuff on the east limb beginning to to rotate into stereo's view. These are bright regions that were on the Earth-facing disk about a week ago, and they had boosted the solar flux up quite a bit. So they have managed to survive their far-sighted passage, and they will be rotating back into Earth view here in less than a week. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, hey, keep your fingers crossed because it looks like we're going to get a boost in radio propagation. And now for your Leo Mio Geo Orbit Outlook. As we switch to our low energy environment, now these are the particles that charge up the outside of spacecraft, including the solar arrays, that then can discharge and cause disruptions and electrical short circuits. As we look at the particle fluxes, you can see that big ring around GEO that's building, and it even is beginning to dip into the MEO orbits. And this is because we have that fast solar wind that just keeps coming, but it's not a big enough solar storm to cause any flushing. So again, the orbit's just getting worse and worse and worse with these fluxes, you can see the injections, especially in the pre-dawn regions. So you satellite operators, especially 
for geo orbits and possibly into MEO orbits. Expect some surface charging issues here over the next couple days. Now, as we switch to our higher energy environment, now these are the particles that end up penetrating a bit more deeply and can cause like things like single event upsets and cause performance degradation. These particles are also beginning to, to build up. You can see that red ring just inside of geo moving down into the MEO orbits. So we're not expecting anything quite yet when it comes to internal charging, but definitely over the next few days, as this fast solar wind continues to pummel Earth, expect issues with internal charging, uh, maybe even over the next week. For more details on this week's space weather, including when and where to see Aurora and how space traffic is going to fare, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Now, usually when we're talking about spaceflight celebrities, that's something that just never pops up. But if you have paid attention to NASA in the past week, you'll know that in an official capacity, they have acknowledged that they are presently working with Tom Cruise to figure out how to actually film an action-adventure movie on board of the International Space Station. Now, there's been nothing official as in who's going to be going and what's actually going to be happening on the station, but those talks, they are actually underway. And SpaceX and its Crew Dragon may be involved as well. Details are very scarce regarding specifics, but last year NASA did approve allowing private astronauts to spend up to a month aboard the International Space Station, and Crew Dragon is able to fly four astronauts at a time. So you could potentially send Tom Cruise, two members of a film crew, and a professional astronaut up on the same launch. Now, Tom Cruise is really well known in the movie industry for doing his own stunts. When he was hanging off of that plane in Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, he really was hanging off of that plane. And in the last movie, when he did that halo jump, he actually really did do the halo jump. But if Tom does head to the International Space Station to film a movie, you might be surprised to learn that this will not be the first film shot in space. In 2009, astronaut Richard Garriott, who bought a seat on a Soyuz in a two week stay on the ISS for a cool $30 million made a nine minute short film called Apogee of Fear while on board with three of the astronauts participating in front of and behind the camera. And you can actually watch it on YouTube. I'll go ahead and include a link in the description of our video here. It is a bit cheesy, but hey, it's the real deal and it was shot in space and it's really a good reason to, you know, maybe give astronauts some acting lessons. But even before 2009, there actually was a film that was shot partially in space. Back in 1983, a Soviet film called Return from Orbit was released, and it's about the Salyut space station getting hit by a micrometeoroid impact, which damages a whole bunch of systems, injures the commander on board, and the astronauts have to figure out a way to get home. Oh yeah, that sounds quite like a uh, familiar movie that might have been made 30 years later in 2013. Now, some of the shots in that movie were actually shot on board of Salyut 7 by the crew of Soyuz T9. And to wrap up this week's space news, I of course want to thank all of you who help contribute to the shows here at Tomorrow. We really can't do this without you, and each and every one of you who does so, you are amazing and it's greatly appreciated. Seriously, I wouldn't even be able to do this out of my garage if it wasn't for all of you. Now, if you'd like to contribute to the shows of tomorrow, head on over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join to do so, and check out all the great rewards we have available to you at the different levels of support. And of course, watching our shows, liking, subscribing, setting up notifications and sharing our videos everywhere is one way that you can help as well. And that's Miko for this edition of Tomorrow News. Thank you so much for watching this week and remember, stay healthy, stay safe, and keep exploring.